Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran selling VIP packages to your gig at a winery, or else a scrappy upstart, Running into fans on the smoking balcony of the rock show, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's the fourth Friday of October 2021, and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy named Lawrence, who drove a Mitsubishi Mirage with a Dayglow spoiler, and who was always trying to sell you hard drugs in a Long John Silver's parking lot. And old Lawrence would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that would be obsolete in six months. But it's the future now, you guys. That's not how it works anymore. We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in. Hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free. The Working Songwriter Podcast listeners can go to bandzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days. Simply use the promo code TWS to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming weeks... Every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, every single Sunday night, I'm over on YouTube for Sunday Songs. That's a live stream. I'm live. I'm playing tunes live. I'm taking questions in the live chat. I'm taking requests in the live chat. It's a really fun, really interactive experience. I think that we're building something of a small community over there on Sunday nights, including many people who are listeners to this podcast. So come on over and be a part of it. Every Sunday night, 9 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, head on over to YouTube and search for Joe Pug or go to JoePugMusic.com and click on the live stream tab. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P A T. R-E-O-N, you search for The Working Songwriter, or you search for my name, then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, a subscription that you don't have to pay for, but that you choose to pay for because you dig the show, and you won't miss a few bucks at the end of the month. If just 1% of our listenership would kick in the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make an immense difference. So thank you to everybody who's taken the time to do that, and if you're not in a place to do that, I I totally understand you can still contribute to the show in a couple ways that are free. First, you could leave us a rating in the iTunes store, or second, you could simply tell a friend about the show, spread the word about the show. The simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. Okay, that's all the harassment I have for you this week. I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Dave. Our guest this week came of age in Philadelphia's hardcore scene, but his musical path since has taken some unexpected turns. Dave Hawes got his start with notable East Coast punk bands The Curse and The Loved Ones. From there, he launched a critically acclaimed solo career that became his main project. He's recorded for Jade Tree, Fat Wreck, and Rise Records, 
He's toured with The Gaslight Anthem, Social Distortion, The Avett Brothers, Bad Religion, Flogging Molly, and many others. His music has appeared on the acclaimed television shows Chicago Fire and Billions. The Los Angeles Times said his album Bury Me in Philly has an undeniable pop buoyancy. American Songwriter has noted that he's a celebrated songwriter who's dabbled in everything from folk to punk. Rolling Stone has called the first single from his new album, Euphoric. Dave recently released an album with his brother Tim entitled Blood Harmony, and I got a chance to catch up with him on the phone a few weeks ago to hear about his journey so far. Dave Haas, thanks so much for being a part of the Working Songwriter podcast. Uh, there's so many different places we got to get to today because you've had so many different chapters in your career. I guess let's start at the beginning. You got your start uh, in, in the hardcore scene in, in Philadelphia <laughs> yeah. playing with The Curse. How did you get into music and uh, what did that scene look like when you were first starting out? Well, it looks increasingly crazy from this vantage. Um, you know, I was raised in an evangelical Christian household. And um, and so, you know, simultaneously, my dad was into Bob Dylan and Dire Straits and Bruce Springsteen and the Beatles and all of the stuff that um, really colors the work I do now. Um, that was Those were the building blocks as a, as a little kid. And I had this inordinate amount of of interest in music um the, the the band the hooters that was uh popular in the 80s and setting the local scene on fire i i, I was like seven years old and going to see them with an uncle and uh, transfixed by their vinyl and so early on there were these seeds of like being super into music as a kid um and as i got into my teen years and the evangelical push of the uh the 90s uh, came down along with punk rock and grunge and all those natural, that swirl of, of, of struggling with the way I was being brought up with all of my base instincts, you know, which were sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, I naturally gravitated towards punk and hardcore in my teens and, um, and then started bands. So I kind of learned to perform and learned to play in that high energy crazy situation where people are stage diving and slam dancing and um and and really uh it was pretty violent honestly in the, in the, by the time we got going um i guess my first my high school band step ahead with which i still have like two of my best friends in the world or uh, to this day um that band uh was born out of a really violent Philadelphia hardcore scene. And we were like positive kids, you know, we were trying to make uh, our way and, you know, we we're interested in all kinds of different music and, and trying to synthesize all that into our songs. But it was at a particularly bleak point uh, where scene violence was at a, at a peak. Um, so looking back now, the, 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 the older I get, the more crazy that feels. Like, um, give us an example. Like, when you say violence, like, what, what does that look like on a day-to-day -day or show-to-show -show basis? Uh, it means that, you know, within a, a mosh pit or a show, there would be friends of ours from our neighborhood that would come with us, would interface with the local um, scenesters, the people that were, went to every show, and a fight would break out. And then there would be a beef that would go on and on and, and there would be, Oh, that's, that's your guy. And we came to your show and he's one of your guys. So we've got to be, you know, it was like this kind of crazy swirl of constant friction. I think with kids from the actual city and then kids coming in from the suburbs and we were sort of caught in between because we came from a neighborhood in the city, but we weren't um, part of the like super cool uh, and somewhat violent. And I say cool in, in quotes, uh, scene. So uh, that's the curse kind of came out of that. Kid Dynamite was a band that was that got popular that I worked for. I, I went, that was my first foray into touring was selling their t-shirts. And I started the curse around that same time influenced by that that fast uh, Gorilla Biscuits kind of um, Kid Dynamite, super fast and then mosh part kind of melodic hardcore. And um you know, pretty quickly figured out, hey, there's no women here. There's no girls coming to these shows. And uh, there's a ceiling on the creativity of what you're actually allowed to do. Um, 
And uh, progressively, as I went through the rest of my musical journey, uh, you know, just naturally gravitated more towards the music of my youth and, and the things that influenced me as a kid. And that's kind of, that's been the, the journey kind of ever since then. It's funny, you know, you say that what drew you to hardcore at first was sort of like the more cultural and, and lifestyle kind of base elements of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I'm, I'm sure that's part of it. But, you know, when I hear you say that, I also think coming from an evangelical background, to go from that to the hardcore scene, it seems like an evangelical would be looking for similar things that a kid going into hardcore would be looking for, which is transcendence, which is being drawn outside of yourself and into something larger. Um, this is why I love your podcast, man, because that's an astute <laughs> observation. And um, and looking back, I think the hardest struggle I have, you know, when you look back at your younger self, there's in, it's like looking anybody looking at a yearbook picture or something. You you see it, and there's a slight amount of embarrassment. And I've talked about my years in the hardcore scene with friends who have who have uh, who are either still involved or look back more fondly. And I think that's what I'm. That's what I'm struggling with when I look back critically. I, I realize I went from one cult to another. One set of, um, you know, one set of rules in evangelical Christianity that, that felt smothering to another one that felt like uh, community. And, and, and so some of the things were allowed, but really quickly I found, oh, no, there's rules here too. And of they, course, because that's how you build a community very fast is with or right. orthodoxy. I mean, that, literally yes. orthodoxy. Yes, know? yes. And I think, you know, as I was writing songs in that paradigm, uh, pretty quickly I was interfacing with some of the most successful songwriters in that world, you know, in, in the hardcore world. And it was crazy what I was allowed and not allowed to do when I would share my songs. Oh, well, you know, you don't want to get too much of this influence in there, or you don't want to have a, uh, you know, and I, pretty quickly I was like, wait a second, this isn't Joe Strummer. This isn't, you know, this is orthodoxy as you describe. And, and I think uh, that's what kept me moving. I, I didn't spend very long in the curse. It was about a year uh, the band dissipated, and then I said, oh, I'm doing the loved ones. And in my mind, that was a lot freer. It was still pretty punk and, and pretty uh, and pretty attached to the orthodoxies of, of a slightly broader umbrella in punk rock. But I felt like, oh, man, I got, moved. I got room to move here. I can play an acoustic guitar on a song, or I can add organ, or I can be more melodic. And so the loved ones was that next evolution towards essentially what I'm doing now uh you know it doesn't sound that way as much now to me because I say right. wow that guy's playing really fast <laughs> well did you catch a bunch of grief for for uh uh going against the cathedral as it were um sort of we didn't make enough of a dent in uh we weren't we were just on the come up, the curse was, um, and then people seemed to like the loved ones, so I didn't catch a lot of grief. I think the loved ones caught grief between records one and two, wherein I really pushed back. Um, we had a pretty successful first album within that scene, you know, we were getting tours with some of the biggest bands, and, and we sold well, you know, we were headlining and starting to play to three or four hundred people, five hundred people, um, and I didn't even realize how well it was going at the time. And uh, we were over in Europe, and I got Boys and Girls in America, the Hold Steady record. And it felt like, oh, right, this is a blueprint for how to be um, in your 30s. I was about 28 and in a rock and roll band, right? So I thought, oh, and it just really shook me to my core. I'll never forget being in the bus bunk on, on our European tour and hearing that and thinking, uh-oh. I, we left some things out of that first record that I want to be doing. And um, that along with a ton of other influences. I mean, at that point, I had been pretty um, pretty exposed to a lot of the singer-songwriter world that had been developing over the early 2000s. You know, I was an avid listener to WXPN in Philadelphia because I was a contractor at the same time. Mm. And that's what we had on all the time. So I was getting in, uh, you know, getting exposed to Steve Earle and Laurie McKenna and uh, Rodney Crowell and and all that stuff. You know, the the sort of modern songwriting 
singer songwriter paradigm was was making its way in through most of my 20s while I was touring in hardcore and punk bands and also as a roadie there was a couple of years I left out there where I roadied for sick of it all and for the bouncing souls so two of the you know most successful east coast uh punk rock pillars um I kind of learned how to tour that way so all of this was this weird it's it all seemed incongruent at the time and and it sort of now is what feels like uh you know the kind of two poles between which i'm operating now that you are where you are though don't you feel good that you took all those seemingly incongruent things because i i think sometimes one thing that i've noticed um over my career and, and watching the careers of my friends is some people can hit it really hard in their 20s because they can do one thing really yeah. good and right. they just they just jump straight forward but then in some ways it doesn't always age well because they just do that one thing and there, there's been not as much development whereas i think the artists that i'm going to end up listening to for you know my whole life or that people listen to for generations or decades mm-hmm. are artists that like you know in their late 20s even early 30s like they didn't they were doing something that was compelling, but they didn't quite have it figured out yet, and it takes them a lot longer to amalgamate um, all that stuff. I mean, how did you have the patience to do that? Because to do that, you have to watch a lot of people zoom by you. You know what I mean? We did watch that, and that was frustrating, and I had to um, really face those feelings down. I mean, the biggest example of that was the loved ones took out the Gaslight Anthem, um, mm-hmm. and you know, on tour and, and they, you know, when I met Brian Fallon, he told me the loved ones are the band I wish I could be in. You guys mm-hmm. are the coolest kind of thing. And we became fast friends. We took them out on tour and they blew by not only us, but everybody in the scene, you know, by the sure. time they got to their peak, they were as big as social distortion or whatever, um, on their way to the Foo Fighters, frankly. But, um, uh, it, you know, I think you have to keep perspective i mean that's what therapy's there for that's what you know if you can't root for your friends um were they ever your friends there's there's a little bit of that you know are you are you a jealous person and um i always find that to be such um such a repellent quality when i run into it with others you know and so i thought well when when that kind of thing happened, I thought, well, am I going to be? I have a choice here. I can either be jealous of their success or root for them. Um, but I think the patience you ask about, um, I don't know if it's patience so much as it's hard headedness. I think, um, you know, I think I have sort of op- oppositional defiant disorder or whatever that is, um, wherein. You know, the loved ones made a record, that first record, and it was semi-successful. It put us on a on a path. And I was like, well, I was doing interviews wherein people would ask about the owner of the label because he was in a famous punk band or um, the bands we were opening for or you know, just all this punk rock stuff that I was like, I'm not interested in this. I spent so much time writing about the death of my mom on, on this record and that would be the fourth question or the fifth question because it was we were within this um, genre. And um, so it frustrated me and, and compelled me to push musically into whatever we did next, which is sort of on its way to my solo work. And then even my first solo record is, is a bunch of punk rockers with an appreciation for songs and roots music, but didn't know what we were doing. I mean, we were kind of just making an album, press and record, and, and it sort of has its own magic that way, but it definitely took until my second solo record to go into a proper studio and understand the dynamics that are at play within, you know, making records well and, and so on. So I think it had a lot more to do with a hard-headedness and like a, even to my commercial detriment, I didn't want to just do one thing because as you describe, I had seen bands that I had worked for bands that were 10 and 15 years into doing a thing Mm -hmm. and they were coming up on the ceiling of what they could do. And I don't necessarily mean commercially. I mean, creatively, they, they would have these great, the souls in particular, the bouncing souls would, would add an acoustic song or, or um, go for a different feel or whatever. And their fans would give them flack. And I just thought, but this is a great idea. These guys are really committed to the song here. Yes. And um, and so I think maybe in a weird way that that influenced me to go like, no, I want I want a full palette available. I don't want to get stuck in doing one thing. And um, 
you know, I think maybe to my commercial detriment, but definitely to my creative um, uh, freedom. Yeah. I don't know if you follow the comedian Bill Burr at all, but he jokes around about not being able to be canceled, or at least he did years ago, because he said, what are you going to do, make me go back and play clubs in a strip mall? That's already what I'm doing. Yes. And uh, (laughs) that's kind of how I've always felt like, you know, I've I've been playing the same nightclubs for 15 years now, you know, and and it's, there is a part of you that says like, well, that's, would have thought that I would have made it somewhere else besides here, but you're still thankful that you're there. But then at the same time, I think to myself, well, there's still people showing up at these clubs and I've tried very different things Mm -hmm. over the years. So, you know, I'm still, the home fires are still kind of burning. uh, They're really burning. I mean, as a fan of your work, I, I, um, I think that's tremendous. That's the kind of artistry that is compelling to me, especially as we age. I mean, I think that aging in rock and roll is a tricky... Oh, look, my poster uh, fell. <laughs> um, it's a tricky thing to to pull off. Um, aging with grace, that is. Yes. And um, and I think that a person like yourself, or or because of the work that I'm doing now, like I can play my songs in my 60s or 70s on a stool in a small club and still work. And, yes. and, and that to me is a real, uh, that's my retirement plan. Frankly, I don't have another option yeah. as, f- I mean, I, I could, I could get into other stuff, I suppose, but there's something dignified still about, um, going into a nightclub like you're describing, like whether it's a city winery or, or a listening room where people are comfortable and sat and it sounds good uh, it can be a small audience, and I can play, and um, there doesn't need to be a banner drop and, and an intro and lighting and all that stuff. It can just be the songs because of the hopefully sturdy work that I'm trying to put in now. Um, so there, it does have to do with sort of a working class discipline that I'm I'm trying to keep all that in mind, and and I just think it's an easier. Um, long-term plan if you want to play music as your job it, it, it's to focus on the song not all the trappings of of how you necessarily produce or present it all the time you just mentioned music as a job and what's funny to me is is one of those orthodoxies that we we talked about before coming out of the the hardcore community it, there's um there's a thing in a lot of music in the late nineties and early two thousands, like the idea that you'd be selling out if you, uh, in some way paid any attention to how to make things work yes. as a business. So how did you, I mean, you've obviously spent a lot of time, um, thinking about how to make this work as a job and as a business, as any working artist who makes it past the age of 30 does. I mean, you, you have right. to think about it or you, you, um, you're in penury before you know it. So, um, how did you make peace with that? And how did you learn to to build a business? Were, were you learning that from the Bouncing Souls when you were on tour with them? Were you learning that from other artists that you, um, uh, uh, you know, worked for and, and roadied for and stuff like that? Yeah, there was a, there was a lot of learning that went on there. There was um, also, when I started The Loved Ones, I had been used to making roadie wages, which were pretty good, you know? Um, and I was married at the time to my first wife and... Uh, we had bought a house and so on, and I was starting a punk band, you know. So she was like, "Look, I, I don't. How are we going to afford all this stuff that we have if you're starting a band where you get paid a hundred bucks a night?" So I started a contracting company. I had been doing carpentry and tile work and so on, residential remodeling for years in between tours. And I started a um, a company with a partner. Um, and ran the logistical side for the most part when I was on tour and then worked on site when I was home. So it was, it was a, it was kind of a crazy thing to bite off, but I did learn a lot about how business, small businesses work or don't work. I mean, we were a victim of the crash of 2008, nine, um, the band and the business, the construction business was, Oh boy, yeah. um, yeah, which sort of begat an early foray into playing solo, you know, that I sort of jumped the gun on playing solo based on, well, there's no carpentry work and ticket sales are down for bands and okay, I'll go to Canada and, and play 15 shows for 200 yeah. bucks a night with my acoustic guitar kind of thing. So it sort of was um, a trial by fire situation as far as how to run a business. I'm still learning. You know, I, I, um, 
I think um, as far as getting out from under that notion that you were a sellout, um, thankfully the culture shifted. There were so many successful bands that came out of um, alternative music uh, right before I, I did it professionally. You know what I mean? So in the 90s, there was that whole boom of uh, of MTV and, and um, alternative, you know, spin, all that. So there was a whole infrastructure and so by the time I was making music semi-professionally in 2004, um, the sellout thing had mostly dissipated. Um, it the Things had started to move towards streaming and so on. And I caught some flack. But the interesting thing is now in my 40s, my early 40s, when I go back and do things, um, like I got to sing the national anthem at a Phillies game two That's weeks awesome. ago, That's which great. was really difficult but really fun and really cool it was an honor to get to do that some of the loudest voices are the hardcore kids that i came up with that probably go to ball games and drink craft beer now um <laughs> and they were like you know they were excited about it they were like look one of ours did it kind of thing like so yeah. it's sort of come full circle um in that sense i don't i did i caught some flack for sure but i also never hung around any particular scene long enough to get that entrenched um you know i was out touring when a lot of the indo indoctrination of my hardcore pals was happening you know they were going to show after show after show and i was already gone was sick of it all or with kid dynamite or whatever so i was out i was road indoctrinated more so than i was local scene indoctrinated yeah, th there's a practicality to being on the road that there isn't always at the uh, the local five dollar punk show. To be sure, that's right. That's right. There's a certain amount of politics that are irrelevant. <laughs> yes, <laughs> when, yeah. when you, you just have to g figure out where you can shower and where where there's food. If there's food, are is anyone going to come? We're in Indianapolis, kind of thing. <laughs> Which I think uh, the answer in Indianapolis is always no. There's nobody coming in Indianapolis. I, I, that's the same for me. However, I just looked at a census report and Indianapolis is like, it is bigger than probably most of the places where you and I have successful headlining shows. Towns are strange like that, man. Isn't they, that they, crazy? They, towns are strange like that. Yep. I, I don't know. I don't know what that is, but... Uh, like population wise, I mean, it, it's yeah. got more people than than San Francisco or something. I don't know if that's exactly true, but but it's something crazy like that. Like after the census data came out. I was like, whoa, we should be playing Houston more, but people don't tend to come in Houston. They no. come in Austin. I don't know. It's weird. Are you stuck in a rut? Are you tired of listening to that Jimmy Buffett 20th Century Masters CD over and over again and need some new music? Are you sick of making hamburger help or beef stroganoff for dinner every night and you want something new to cook? What you are looking for, my friends, is the Enthusiast Digest. That's my monthly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox the first Sunday morning of every month, bursting with musical recommendations, poetry selections, recipes and cooking techniques for my favorite dishes, and items of general interest culled from the vast cesspool that is the internet. The Enthusiast Digest is free to subscribe to. If you dig the poetry that you hear on this show and the artists that you're hearing from, you'll dig the newsletter because I approach it with the exact same sensibility of curation. Go to joepugmusic.com slash newsletter today to sign up for free. That is joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. It takes approximately 15 seconds to sign up for a free newsletter that will enrich the first Sunday of your month with a veritable cornucopia of new and delightful recommendations. That's the Enthusiast Digest, the first Sunday of every month. Sign up for free at joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. When Dave talked about his early days in the hardcore scene and its insistence on orthodoxy among its members, there's a part of me that relishes not being a part of a rigid musical community. 
But there's another part of me that secretly wonders what it would be like to feel a sense of belonging in such a community. A community that, for better or for worse, knew what its values were and was able to elevate them to a level of transcendence. As I go about my daily life as an artist, I long for more of that transcendence and less of the QuickBooks Excel sheet where I categorize expenses from a recent tour. And there's a wonderful poem that contrasts the difference between the mundane worries we have on a day-to-day basis with the hidden world of transcendent value, an unseen value that music can often intimate. It's entitled, In the Year of Our Lord, by Travis Wright. In a few thousand million years, this galaxy where the wren sings and the dogwood grows fast from the muck and root of winter rot, where bodies come from bodies but embark the body and never come back, where the heaving chorus of summer cicada prays and prays the pull and drop of dark at dust. This galaxy, written in the language of mathematics, where octopi change color as they dream, and my wife comes home with flowers asking if I like them, and I, obviously annoyed, answer, yes, but how much did they cost? In a few thousand million years, this galaxy will feel its way as though through a black bedroom at night, as after a dream when the shape of things are not what they seem, and find behind this silhouette a threat when the wall stops its sight. And then, instead of music, and the mystery of your white hand in mine, instead of our daughter's next birthday, laughter, and the words of forgiveness on Sunday, instead, this starry ossuary, crashing blankly across a glassy top of voided sky, tripping between star and quasar, and splitting atoms where it once gave sight, splitting sound into silence, splitting us into elegy. I do not know what heaven will be like. I know, though, that when it comes, our tears will run, run like rivers away from our faces, because every happiness will be recent. I know what you love and was brought by ambulance to the coroner will return to you. I know the wren will sing, that broken planets will be rebuilt, that we will learn where to be weak for those we love and when to work and wait for their forgiveness, that our bodies will be thrown open like broken doors to an autumn day and the flowers will cost us nothing, in fact, if not praise. I want to get under the hood with you to talk about how your writing style has changed over the years because it's it sounds like it was a much different process writing for the loved ones than it is now for your own solo project. Is that the case? Is it different now? Like what did those two processes look like or did they look the same? Well, they looked the same to me in the moment. Um, I was, you know, my North Stars for songwriting haven't changed that much. Um, you know, Patty Griffin is lo- loomed large over the first Loved Ones record and looms large to this day. Um, uh, Bruce Springsteen, Tom Petty, like all that stuff is, they're all the, the pillars, the clash, etc. I think the difference might, the, the, the biggest difference is when you're writing um, for a band like the, Lo- when I was writing for the Loved Ones, um, there are probably a litany of sins or weaknesses in a song that you can breeze past because of of loud cymbals, a lot of gain on the guitars, the excitement of what's coming at you, you know, like um, when you're recording and capturing things that are that dynamic. Not They're not even that dynamic. They're sort of all one thing, you know, it's all loud and fast. And um, you can kind of, uh, commit other sins that wouldn't that would be a lot more uh, they would they would appear to be bigger blemishes if you just were singing them with an acoustic guitar and I think a lot of times when I've tried to take old loved one songs I get a request or something at a show and tried to play it or learn it acoustically 
I've seen, oh, there's a lot of hatchet marks in this song that didn't get sanded um, because of the velocity at which we were playing or whatever. Um, and I think now I just, I feel like there's, I, I guess I'm just trying to make everything sturdier now um, and not rely on any tricks. I think that that's probably the main thing that's shifted. But I, I think that would probably happen with age anyway, right? Like, I think if you look at Paul Simon or or Leonard Cohen or anybody like that, their, their songs got sturdier as they went on. There were less um, throw... And I hate to even say there's a throwaway line in any Leonard Cohen song. But when you hear the later work, the economy of of wit and the economy of words is so succinct that um he, he definitely got better and and you would hope you'd get better if this is what we do uh year in year out really in some instances day in day out um so i think that's probably the biggest shift but the fundamental um commitment to the emotion and the craft hasn't changed that much. I mean, I kind of knew because I got a late start, I was 26 or 27 when we started the loved ones. Um, I kind of already knew that you got to build these melodies so that they stick in people's heads or they stick in your head. So you remember the song um, and, and you want to make lyrics that are um, compelling enough for your own emotional interfacing so that hopefully other people can sing them because you know i'm sort of one of those firm believers in like songs are meant to be sung i think i bring that from the church uh that you want to make i often want to make i mean there's obviously uh deep tracks and and places you go artistically that are that are further out frontiers but for me i'm i'm hoping that when we do our best work my brother and i now who i pretty much co-write everything with uh, we're hoping that that song gets sung by someone else um, at a, at a whether it's a show or or another songwriter hears it and goes, boy, I I can connect with this. I'm going to play this at my my show or you know, <laughs> um, I feel like that's often the mark of 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 good work on on our behalf. I feel like that melodic structure that you're talking about is a hallmark of of what you do. It might be hard to describe it, but I, I'd appreciate it if you tried to describe how you try to put those melodies together, how you structure them. Um, are, are you literally thinking, you know, with the end in mind of as you write a melody, you're thinking whether someone could sing that or not? Are you breaking it apart and trying different ascending or descending lines? Like how, how do no, you... No, that's, that's an innate them? thing. I think that comes from... Um, because, because, I mean, we think about it later in the choosing of the songs that we're going to release or, or put out. But no, initially, I just love melody. I love pop. You know, I think it's actually pretty easy to describe that's what it is. It's pop music. It's everything from the Beatles to Dua Lipa to, uh, I mean, I just love pop. And, um, and you know, I think typically when, when Tim and I are working together, the catchier the song initially, the more drawn we are to working on it. Now, sometimes we have to, tame that down you can get carried away with trying to make things catchy and, and i think we've all heard pop that's so far beyond the pale that you look sort of lose the listener by trying to you know over decorate the christmas tree so to speak but um i'm just drawn to that and i do think that comes from hearing hymns and 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 so on as a kid and then being a, a kid of the radio in the 80s and 90s i mean all that stuff is so catchy that's what I was really exposed to at the most formative time. And uh, and as I got older and got into punk, that was less and less um, the point of the music. In other words, it was more about the culture or the message or the excitement or the energy. And, um, and that was cool. There's great songwriters that have come out of that. But uh, for the most part, you know, it's about Full Moon Fever for me. It's about Reckless by Brian Adams. It's about... Um, you know, Bonnie Raitt, it's stuff like that that really is the DNA of, of what I still love. I still love all those records and listen to them all the time. And uh, so I think we're, that's where a lot of that love of melody and, and where that drift towards it comes from. 
So when you're sitting down nuts and bolts to work, is it you're sitting down and opening up your phone that has a bunch of voice memos or you've grabbed these melodies? Does it, are you starting blank? Like what does it look like on a day-to-day basis when you have time to write and sit down to do it? Yeah, it's rare that it's starting completely from stop. Um, there's typically some melodic idea that blew through my brain and I put down on a voice note. It's typically that. It's, oh man, I got a really good melody or, or it's a melody coupled with a little bit of lyric or a chorus or something. Okay, I got to get back into that. I really like that. And then start to figure out what that melody is trying to do or trying to say. And then there's an enormous amount of lyrics in, in various files from over the years that I tried to get more organized on during during quarantine and, and successfully kind of cataloged a lot of it and pulled a song or two from the new record from that catalog. Um, but it's a lot of, um, let's find what's compelling that I've left behind. I leave breadcrumbs. Um, I would like to get to a point where I can start from nothing, like grab a guitar and and there's songs that have come that way, and, and successful songs. So to, you know, I mean, I don't have any hits, so we say successful with an asterisk. <laughs> but but um, uh, you know, that song "Saboteurs" was sort of a stop, like starting from nothing. And um, okay, you know, I, I, I let me just grab a guitar and see what comes out. And yeah. that idea started to swirl. And then there's just a lot of refinement and editing over time. Like that's what on this last record we approached it, Tim and I approached it with the most discipline I've ever written. I mean, I wrote more songs in 2021 in a concentrated period than I had in like years previous because we met on Monday and we held ourselves to a thing we called Pencils Down Friday. And uh, we had to bring each an idea on Monday and we would work on it together each day, nine uh, o'clock, we'd Zoom and by Friday, we had to each turn in, in, in quotes, uh, a finished song. It didn't have to be good, but it had to be done. We couldn't do any of the things that I'm sure you and I have done for years where it's, well, there'd be this really good bridge that goes, da-da-da-da-da, you know, like, I got a melody, but no, no, no. We had to have some word, uh, some some lyric that was attached to that idea so that you had something to critique, you had something to to go off of, or or at least something to throw out, you know. Um, something to throw out. That, that kind of accountability is really important, and ninety percent of it ends up being unusable. But you never would have gotten that ten percent without that sort of accountability and without that process. It's true. I mean, your your podcast is called the Working Songwriter, and and that's what uh, I aspire to do, especially as I get older and all of the um, the stuff that's attached to ego that that we were drawn to as younger younger men or, or younger women, you know, that that stuff is so not helpful and so not interesting to me anymore. And, and you know, I love a rock and roll show. I, I love to do those. I love to bring out the band and tour that way. And but there's a certain a certain amount of ego and and um, look at me that I'm just not as compelled by anymore i like the work i like to get up and and meet tim on the zoom or or when we're in person you know sit with some coffee and and an idea that we're interested in and like work on it and and i mean you know that feeling it's just magic i do and and i think i also know what you're talking about the difference between being younger and wanting to be in a band and and on stage and and in some ways i mean if we're going to continue to use these analogies uh, like worshipped uh, in a yes. way, and yes. whereas the last few times that I saw John Prine play live, the vibe that I got from him and the vibe that I got from the audience and John Prine and the audience interacting was, it was almost as if John Prine walked on stage and he had a briefcase full of these beautiful jewels, and these jewels would be the songs, mm-hmm. and he just walked on stage and he opened the briefcase and just kind of said to the audience like aren't these beautiful? Aren't these great? And the audience said, yeah, man, those are great. And it, in the strangest way possible, I mean, everyone knows that he wrote the songs. Everyone knows that he's there performing them. And in a sense, you are clapping for John Prine, but they were being presented in a way 
much more of we were clapping for the songs, which kind of existed in a way outside of him. And, and he was kind of a, a member of the audience himself saying, yeah, damn, these, these are pretty good. You know, I, I like these too. You see, you're tapping in on something that's so fundamental to it. If, if, if you stay open, I think that's what it is. Yes, it takes work to get a jewel out of a rock, mm-hmm. right? And that's the work we're talking about. Do you worship the the person that chips that that jewel out? No, you 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 go. Wow, you found this jewel. You might give him a kudos for finding it, but I just think it's that's really more of what we're up to because I think that there is sort of a collective consciousness. I mean, how many times have you had a voice note or a lyric in your file, and then you'll hear a new song by Jenny Lewis or or just someone that's you don't even know or have a lot of connection to and they'll have that similar idea that they just got to first or they or they recorded first um and to me there's something cosmic about that i used to go oh damn it you know that that idea uh went to so and so there's that sort of prince michael jackson thing where they they thought that god was giving one of them more ideas than the other or whatever <laughs> And, I hadn't which heard is, that, but that's great. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of the reasons that Michael Jackson uh, allegedly got so um, he got got so little sleep because he was afraid that if he slept, that God would send the ideas for songs to Prince. <laughs> I mean, how crazy is that? Isn't that wild? That's so fantastic. But 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 really, I mean it. So I think there is something cosmic about like there's there's a river. Everybody's pulling these fish out of and um and i think that john prine was right to approach it that way because yeah sure he wrote them and all that stuff but like what does that matter right if let's get together and enjoy the the gems uh, um the critical part though dave yes you don't you don't um uh, worship the person that brought the gems out but you do have to pay that person <laughs> that's right critical <laughs> Critical. Critical. That's right. You have um, to pay uh, the guys <laughs> that are down in the mine getting these gems, and you and hopefully you pay very handsomely. <laughs> exactly. And, and people, did, I mean, and by the by the end with with John Prine, you know, he was a national treasure, and mm-hmm. and they did, you know. But but again, yeah, I just I need to stress it. It wasn't some uh, cult of personality worship thing for him. It was it was. So I don't know how he got there. I, I, I don't know how he arrived at that point. I'm sure he didn't start in that way. Everyone starts young and mm-hmm. cocky and full of piss and vinegar and full of me, me, me. Yes. So I'm, I'm sure he didn't start that way. I'm not sure how the journey went, but he certainly got there, man. Well, he was a mailman. So, yeah. I mean, there's a certain humility to just doing a simple job that everybody's counting on. Um, and he wrote that whole first record, allegedly. I don't know if this is just a good legend, but he wrote that first record while delivering mail i don't know i mean he also never really had a hit and i I, what i mean is like he never rose to such great heights that he was uh um lauded in rolling stone and all that stuff in the same way that his contemporary you know most of the other people from that era i mean bonnie Raitt had a much bigger hit with his song than than he did so maybe there was a certain amount of working class distinction that he always carried and he carried that into his older years i mean he that's just a guy that not unlike what we were saying about leonard cohen or whatever it's the economy of word and the commitment to the craft i mean that last record he made was tremendous it was so funny and heartbreaking at the same time it's one of the hardest things to pull off uh, uh, for what it's worth, I, I knew his old uh, manager, uh, Al Bonetta, who's mm-hmm. departed as well. God rest okay. his soul. And uh, But Al described the same thing about John Prine. I, I never met John Prine or got to know him, but Al mm-hmm. described the same thing. He was like, you know, well, you know, John, he really has to lock himself in a room to write because if it was up to him, he'd just go to the diner with a paper and uh, <laughs> and hang out, you know. Yeah, uh, I, so. I I understand that. I mean, I th- I think I mean he just also had that personality that everyone talks about that that was open to humanity. It was open to other people, and I think uh, trying to maintain all that is good for songs. You know, I think like that's what that's where a lot of the grist for the mill comes from is interacting with people and understanding their stories and understanding, you know, trying to have as much empathy for the the other person. And I don't think the the worship me, look at me ego trip that so many 
people get into in their early life and sometimes never get out of. Sometimes never get out, particularly if it if they get it early on. That's right. That's right. They struggle. They struggle with family dynamics, I think, more. Yep. I think, you know, family is a, is a thing if you do right, it's not about you. Um, and, and again, I think that's what's sort of coloring my work now. Like, I remember uh, Tim and I went over to do a church tour in Europe, which was tremendous. I mean, it was uh, all seated in, in churches throughout Germany and England. And uh, we get to the first show, and I had spent about three months at home before that with my children. So my kids were turning two at the time. So it was, it was right at the beginning of 2020. And I remember gearing up for the tour and sitting down, and it was a sold-out seated church in Cologne. It was like, you know, it was a big show. And I struggled for a song or two to even remember what it was like to lead a show. And by lead, I mean be like a front man or whatever you want to say, like be um, on in that way. Because I had spent so much time with my children and was really deriving such joy from that hard work and that and that connection that I suddenly felt far it felt foreign to me to be like uh with a congregation so to speak you know Mm -hmm. I felt like oh this is weird I I want it to be simpler and 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 once I leaned into it I kind of figured out a a a better mix of those two of of like being a a front man and and also just like a normal person that gets up and goes to work and hopefully does things that are compelling but but treats their family with it does a good job at the family part first. Yes, yeah. Those are those are two things to um, that are hard to keep in coexistence. And I think that the only way that they can coexist is if there's no doubt in your mind that if you had to choose one or the other, it would be family, and you'd let the other thing go. And I think if you don't have that straightened out, or if they're kind of fighting against one another, fighting for supremacy, you know, your partner's going to feel that, your kids are going to feel that. Um, yes, it's going to be, you know, that's going to be what it is, you know? Yeah. I also think that what I'm finding, like even today, right today, I drop my kids off. I have interviews throughout the whole day for a new record. And then we go down to Ventura to play with social distortion. It's way too much in one day to be doing. Um, yeah. and so today I sort of got that balance wrong. Thankfully my kids are at daycare and they're doing their thing. And, sure. but I got the balance wrong today. I probably put too much on my plate or too much came that we couldn't say no to. But I think the goal, as you're describing, is like, well, tomorrow I hope I get that balance a little better. And then the next yes. day, and, and hopefully by the time uh, we have an album out and we're on tour, hopefully the schedule is reflective of of, of um, your priorities being in the right place. And, and, and that's, I think, what I'm trying to figure out. That's kind of why I'm we decided to own our own master in, in this particular realm of, of, of our career. You know, like I wanted to put out the record on our own label. Um, now explain to me and to our listeners why for this sort of process, it was so important to own your own master. Well, um, all of the records I had put out previously were licensed. So the, so the, the quick, um, napkin, um, this description of this is you can either, uh, put out a record with a record label where they own your master forever, uh, or you can give it to them for a period of time, or you can own it and then hire label services to kind of do things. But basically, it has to do with how the record gets funded. That is the recording, the 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 um, the making of the actual CDs and, and albums and so on. Um, and in this instance, uh, it was it was incumbent to me to, to, to work with a label services company rather than a label who has the, um, they, they lay out the cash to make the album and, and to manufacture the album. And then like any loan, they make most of the money that comes back in. That's kind of that model. Um, in this model, we lay out the money to record, to manufacture, to, to publicize, we hired our own, you know, publicist and all that stuff. We're paying for all that. And on the back end, as the money comes in from selling the record, we make more of that money than a label would, than the label services would. We're essentially the label. And it, really that had to do with having kids. Um, I don't want, 
you know, 65 cents of every dollar of a record that we sell going to someone else. Um, it's not appealing to me. I'd rather fund it and take that risk on myself and my brother and 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 then reap the rewards there, thereof um, rather than say, oh, you know, can I borrow X amount of money to make an album? I, I just don't want to be asking, I think. That's the other thing is um, I, f- I found that we would have the best laid plans and then when you bring them up to a label or or a company wherein they funded your endeavor, well, they've got not only opinions, but they've got their own schedule. They might have a bigger artist or um, a different priority the week you want to put out your record. And I'm like, hey, but that's that works for my life. My kids are turning this age at this point. That's my wife's birthday or whatever. Right. Fill in the blank of all the things that are priorities for me now that I'm tired of pushing off. I'm I'm tired of saying like, sorry, honey, we're going to be up in Canada on your birthday. Or, you know, I don't want to do that. I, I, I want to maintain enough control. And even if it means um, I've got a smaller company betting on what we're doing, I'm okay with that. It, if, if it gives me the holidays that are important to me and I can say no to things, I, I just, I find that with the with the amount of control that we have right now, we can do what we want and do it in a dignified way. Um, and, and it just, that was really important to me this time. It's funny because it sounds like this is, doing it this way is actually more work for yes. you, but... Since you have more control, that more amount of work can be put into more, as you said, like dignified time uh, yes. chunks. You know what I mean? So it's yes. more work, but it's more in your own terms. I'm okay with more work. I've always been okay with more work. I don't. Yeah. My dad worked every single day of his life until a year or two ago. He went and into that office and and he worked for um you know, a, a paving and, and uh, stone quarry kind of company doing accounts receivable. He was expected to be there all the time. And, and my brother and I have that as our model. And so for me, getting home from a tour and then, you know, Tim doing fulfilling mail order or um, moving gear or getting things ready or starting to record or amassing uh, demos for the next project, like that's that's great to me. That's all work that... As a contractor, I used to swing a hammer. I used to be covered in dust and dirt, and and uh, I don't have to do that anymore. But 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 to me, I don't think that ne- that necessarily buys me like months off to to just do nothing. I I just have never felt good about that when when that was even available when I, when I had no kids and uh, would get done a tour where we made a good amount of money. I never spent the subsequent three or four months that I quote unquote had off, I never spent them well. I, yeah. I frittered the time away or this was back when I was, you know, I wasn't sober back then a lot of the time too. Um, but I just like to have stuff to do ahead of me and I'm okay with, with that. I, and, and I'm better with that actually, frankly, I think that's, um, it's, it's a good model for my, my sons to see. My wife goes to work every day. You know, like everybody's working. What am I going to do? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> go to the beach by myself? <laughs> Some days that'd be all right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, once in a while. Before I let you go, because uh, I know you have other stuff today, uh, talk to us really quickly about the new record uh, with your brother and this recording process that you did in Nashville with, with Will Hogue at the helm. I mean, the record... This is a really cool project. So, so tell our listeners a little bit about how this came together and and how this record was different from other ones that you've worked on in the past. Yeah, we were just really immersed in the writing uh, early in 2021. Um, like I said, Tim and I were cranking out songs we were really happy with, and um, we started to amass a bunch of them. And my manager was like, "Hey, we should record. If you record soon, we'll get this out soon, and we can go back to work in the fall." Okay, cool. Uh, who should we have work on this? I don't know. You know, it was it was a. Yeah, I wasn't clear on who should produce or where we were going to make it, and so Alex Fang, who we've been working with for a couple of years now, said, "Well, look, I, you know, Will Hogue produces." I said, "Whoa, all right. Well, you know, what's that look like? I, I'm a fan of his songs, but." So we just got on a Zoom, and I fell in love with Will Hogue, like many people do, in the first couple minutes. <laughs> and uh, and he said, "Look, man, I 
Alex sent me some demos that of the songs you've been working on. I love this this material. Like I think we can make a great record here in Nashville if you guys want to come down. And so I th- I thought, well, this this is exciting. This is different. And but we were sort of working with the mayor of Nashville, which I sort of didn't realize until he he started to lay out his plan and was like, well, what about um, Sadler Vaden from Jason Isbell's band on guitar? He's a friend of mine. I'm thinking like, well, shit, yeah, that's your friend. I, if he wants to do it, he's like, yeah, I'll send him the demos. I'm sure I'll love these songs. And that happened with each one of the players. Uh, Chris Powell, who plays with Brandy Carlisle, Gary Talent from the E Street Band, <laughs> which was the biggest kind of shocker. And, and um, that was the, you know, he sort of walks in the room 10 minutes before he gets there. His, his, uh, his um, I mean, everybody in the room, even these seasoned Nashville uh, session players were like, whoa, that's Gary Talent from... Yeah the E Street Band. But um, everybody liked the demos and wanted to work on it. And so Will made it really easy. His his approach, again, was very egoless. It was very much like a basketball coach. Um, that's what he wanted to be, I guess, before he was a songwriter, so that he got to, like, flex that muscle. But it was... <laughs> It was really joyful. We we went in with the songs. I would play them for these guys, and they were like charting them in real time. And then they'd get up and walk into the studio and just play them. It was like, yeah, it was like conjuring magic in real time. I, I had a hard time like even knowing what was happening. Sometimes I, I'd hear hear the song, and and it was so beautiful that I'd have to like put my critical hat on and go, wait a second, but it does need to be a little slower. It does need to be right. a little faster. Or that's too country or that's the, you know. So it took some some quick reaction to to catch up with what was happening in the room. But that's pretty much the story of it. Uh, we, we went there. We sort of trusted the process with Will. It's easy to trust him and it's easy to trust those players with, with their pedigree and their history. And we had a blast. I mean, the making of documentary thing comes out uh, on the 16th of October, and you'll and so people can kind of see it happening on that documentary. And I I just think it 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 you can hear it. You can hear the joy. You can hear that level of musicianship from from all the players. And um and you know now it's it's about you know starting to carry it out to to the people. That that's what this whole um, next couple weeks is you know the record comes out in a couple weeks but um it was tremendous it was it was one of the most joyful experiences writing and recording this album of my whole career and and you don't often get that when you're 43 and you've been doing this like this is my fifth solo record and you know eighth or ninth full-length album i've made in my life um to have to hit the most joyful one now is is rare and 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 I guess the cool thing about being this age is you don't take it for granted when it happens. You're like, whoa, hundred percent. You know what I mean? It's it's. I I remember you talking about. Um, I think it was your last record and talking about how the the pro like the when the process is great, um, and and you've and you've got the benefit of comparison. It's really special, man. It's not easy to make albums. It's not easy to write songs. Um, and when when it feels easy, it's so joyful. It 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 really is. Um, uh, well, I'm so excited for this whole uh, album release process for you. I'm very uh, I'm just thrilled about the whole thing. I- I'm most thrilled about thinking about Will Hogue, Bobby Knight style, throwing a, a chair from the sidelines. <laughs> no, that's a- Yes. Yeah. Uh, he, <laughs> I kind of imagine him that, like when the tempo would flag, he he'd go Bobby Knight on everyone basketball coach style. You know what was so. funny about the tempo though with Will <laughs> was those guys all were pushing me to be more like rock and punk. It was yeah. so funny because I'm in there going like, okay, well here are, are the architects of uh, so much wonderful lush singer songwriter music, and Tom Bukovac in particular is this incredible session guitar player that like you know everybody wants to work with him, and I belted out some lyric, and he goes, man, well, well, why aren't we doing more of that? You know, come on, like they all really want to rock. And yeah. so at different points, I was like, no, 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 we're not going to rock this one. Like, this one's intentionally, we're trying to show restraint because of the lyric. And they were like, okay. You know? And All it was right. just so funny to see Will and those guys uh, let to, they, they were sort of letting out their their internal, I don't know, like, 
like uh, Aerosmith or something. You know, they were like, we get to yeah. be Aerosmith for a song. Or so, so it was it was really fun in that way. Like I think like part of that is just like there's a lot of different kinds of songs on the record. Right. Well, they, um, they've all had to play on one too many Americana songs about trains, so they were. They that's were true. To, to, uh... <laughs> yeah. Whereas I sort of always feel like Tarzan in Nashville. I feel like whenever we play, you know, as we've uh, played more and more, uh, like you know, we'll play like a park or something, mm-hmm. like a city park, as part of like the local. Um, uh, station or whatever the NPR affiliate or whatever I always am like boy I feel like this punk rock Tarzan flying in screaming and everyone's like whoa whoa, whoa slow down um it, it it's interesting that so many of the players on this were like no come on let's ramp it up let's rock so it's all it's always a push and pull and I think you know thankfully it, at this point you hope to have enough of your own identity that you can make those calls on the fly and make the wisest choice for the song rather than let all that um, influence the the work ahead. You know, like you can, you can get lost in the sauce of, should this be quiet? Should this be loud? Should this be this? A lot of that stuff is, is um, you just got to trust the moment that you're in. And if you're getting something exciting right there, go for it. 100%. Well, I know you got a busy day, so I'm going to let you go. Dave, thanks so much for being a part of the Working Songwriter Podcast. I love the podcast. Tim and I listen to it on tour all the time. <laughs> and so I was just so thrilled that we got to do it. And and I guess we'll listen to it in the van, but Tim will be like, oh, great, i got to hear you talk again. <laughs> but uh, we're big exactly. fans, man, and I'm, I'm so honored to be on it and looking forward to playing shows together. We've got I'll see that you next month, man. Uh, yeah, awesome. really looking forward to it. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. The new album by Dave Haas is entitled Blood Harmony, available everywhere music is sold or streamed. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, please remember... An expensive drug habit is not a song. A compelling Instagram account is not a song. And most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself. And for you, just keep your eye on the song.